Hey everybody, Dr. Gusso here um, with an announcement that I'm going to, for the next 10 or 11 videos that I do, um, I've decided that it's time to do a presentation that I that I did all at once in one big gulp, uh, sort of in one 45 minute video uh, at SPA, Society for the Preservation and Advancement of Harmonica, some years ago. Um, and when this is all over, I'll upload a sheet. It'll be called New York Blues Harp, Remembering Nat Riddles, 1952 to 1991. And you may not have noticed this, or maybe you have noticed this, but the blues world is, at this particular moment, sort of in the aftermath of the kind of insurgent uh, 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 American response to George Floyd's murder, the blues world itself is having a kind of Black Lives Matter moment. Um, and it's interesting because I have a book coming out this fall called Who's Blues? Facing Up to Race and the Future of the Music. I'll be talking about that a lot more um, in the future. Um, not right now, but what I want to... The opening line of that book turns out to be incredibly prophetic. And the opening line goes like this. Let me see if I can do it from memory. The blues world, the contemporary American mainstream scene and its discussants, the people who discuss it, has a race problem. So we're in a moment right now, and, and blues has gone through this at various periods, and the book in fact talks about that. Um, certainly in the 60s it went through that with uh, the black arts movement. It's going through a period where the blues are getting heavily ideologized, and where the phrase blues is black music is being highlighted in ways that sort of began a few years back with Corey Harris and one of his blogs. Anyway, I'll be talking a lot more about this in the future. But I decided this is the right moment to share with you my whatever audience I've maintained, built and maintained over 13 years, a sort of different perspective. Um, uh, a sort of, yeah, blues is black music, blues is American music, blues is global music, blues is black and white music, blues is ideally a place where, ideally, at its best, the blues world, and certainly this is true in America, and I suspect it's true for you folks in France, in England. At its best, the blues world is a world where Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s idea of beloved community, the idea of sort of the true interrelatedness of black and white, is, is, is born, is nurtured, and where real connections are made. You could say across race lines, but sometimes those lines aren't really lines. Sometimes they're actually just fairly unselfconscious connections. And I was lucky enough to have a mentor, Nat Riddles, who I met when, I'm thinking about 1985, so he would have been 33 and I would have been 27. He was six years older than me. He seemed much older and much hipper. And I, so not exactly a big brother, but there was a way in which our relationship developed in that direction. Um, to the point where one night we both basically kicked, we, we'd had a lot to drink, we were down where he was living in Virginia, we just basically parked by the side of the road and kicked our seats back. I turned one way and he turned the other, and we slept side by side in a little in a car. That's the kind of life we lived, as, as not blues brothers with the hats and sunglasses, but as true blues brothers. He died of cancer in 1991, just as my group, Satan and Adam, was starting to hit the big time. I owe him a lot. Uh, my sound, to the extent that there's anything in my sound that you like, except the overblows, which were not something he did, but the, to the extent that I, I've got a, a certain kind of sound, a lot of it came from him, not just him. But he, if I hadn't met him, I would not be, I would not have had the career I had. So I feel a tremendous debt. But I also, in this particular present moment, feel like you need to hear and we need to be reminded of some of what, some of the way that Nat worked. So Nat, I'm going to just, this is sort of the prologue, this is not step one, I've got ten points, sort of ten uh, lessons from Nat Riddles that I'm going to give you, and none of them are sort of socio-historical in this, in this way, they're all kind of basic practical lessons, but they all have that kind of resonance too, and I think that's important. So let me just talk a little bit, let me actually show you, I'm going to play you a little bit of a cut that I made on the street, but here's some basic discographical stuff, so this is an, uh, the first album that I heard by him. It's by a guy named Len Kunstadt, actually. Len Kunstadt was married to Victoria uh, Spivy, Spivey. Um, and there he is with, with Nat and with Larry Johnson, uh, who played on the album. This is my taped up copy. That's Nat's artwork. Nat was a graphic artist of Pratt. 
Um, and I've got a few of these. So here's one that was a sort of the follow-up on a big on a German label, Horst Lippmann's German label. Uh, Larry Johnson and Nat Riddles Johnson, where'd you get that sound? And then uh, a, an album that Nat made with Charlie Hilbert. So there's there's Charlie and, and Nat and Andy Story, another great New York player. They made it as a trio, two guitars and harp. When uh, at, when I was uh, at that point friends with Nat in New York, um, I gave him that shirt, Easy Reading, that harmonica shirt. When he stayed at my apartment one day, we sort of went through my, my t-shirts and I gave him a bunch of different t-shirts and he took that one. So that was the kind of friendship we had. Um, Nat grew up in the Bronx. If you remember the show, Welcome Back, Cotter, there's sort of like, there's the Italian guy, the black guy, the Jewish guy. You kind of have one of each. It's almost like a World War II movie. That was the Bronx that Nat grew up in. Um, Co-op City, he talked about Co-op City. He grew up in an environment that was actually where whites and blacks got together and they weren't on each other's backs. Uh, they were actually just eating at each other's tables. He, ta he talked about this and he ta he, the, old white, the old Jewish ladies were charmed by, by Nat. Nat was an amazingly charismatic guy um, who had a lot of talents. But that was the world he grew up in. And so when I met Nat in the spring of 85, um, and I met him one night. I was playing, I think I've told this story. I was playing harmonica walking down the street by Columbia University back to my apartment at night and a, and a cab pulled a U-turn. Very dark-skinned, young black guy kind of leaned over and said, well, who was playing? Was that you? And I said, yeah. You know, I just, he said, I thought it sounded good. Uh, I thought I ought to see who you, it sounded good. I thought I ought to see who you were. And that's how we, we met. He got out of his car and like, like harp players, you know, and he opened up a toolkit and it was his harp box and he had all these harmonicas and he took a harp out and he began to play. And as I talk about this in, in Mr. Satan's Apprentice, he went through a series of players and he didn't say, here's a white guy, here's a black guy. He went through and he, he did, he did, uh, uh, well, he did Big Walter Horton. He did, he might have done Sugar Blue. He certainly did John Lee Williamson. Um, he talked about Kim Wilson. He raved about Kim Wilson. Was one of, of course, white player. If we're going to do the racial sort, but you don't have to. But he talked about Kim Wilson, having seen Kim Wilson. And then Sugar Blue, black guy, great street musician. The stories he told about Sugar Blue. Point is, for him, it, there was this blues harmonica world, and it consisted of great players. When he actually, as we began to get to know each other, and of course, I I, I knew some of these players, but most of them, like John Lee Williamson, I didn't. So. He served as somebody who opened up this world for me. And he would talk about the guys that he had taken personal lessons from. And they were, they were Jewish guys. Bob Shatkin, Lenny Rabinovitz, um, and there was one other guy who I met later on in, in New York who, who sort of went, sort of came by one time when I was sitting outside. And so it's Jewish guys. He also talked about Larry Johnson, the guitar player that he played with and how Larry had all these lessons to teach and so that was this is before I played with Sterling McGee Mr. Satan um, but he talked about sort of his elder Larry was his elder so the blues world that he evoked for me and that I came into when I first got somebody who became a teacher the blues world that he evoked for me was a world that contained white and black and it was a panoply a sort of a, 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 a multiplicity of influences, of greats. And he didn't say, these are the black guys, these are the white guys, the black guys really have it, the white guys are sort of faking it. That's not the way he talked. And by the same token, he didn't, to the extent that he showed me stuff, I never felt like he was holding something back. Now, he didn't try to pretend that my experience of the world and his experience were identical. And there were moments where I would see, and he would actually talk to me. He actually told me a story about one time about, and it's in Mr. Satan's Apprentice, about having given up a white guy a, a ride when he was driving a cab. And the guy, he said the guy got out and wouldn't pay him. And he, and, and they, he, Matt, Nat said basically, don't, man, don't do this to me. You can't, don't do this to me. And the guy, and Nat basically said he hit him. Nat hit him. And he wanted me to empathize with the fact that he felt he needed to hit the white guy. So. That's what Blues Brothers share. Um, I realize none of this so far has anything to do with harmonica, but it actually really does, and it has to do with my vision of the blues. There's a famous book called The Gift by a guy named Lewis Hyde. I write about this in Who's Blues. Lewis Hyde uh, 
was not a musician at all, but he said, gifts only live when you give them away. Now that cuts against a lot of the way we tend to think. It certainly cuts against, I imagine, the way that somebody with a possessive investment in the music in racial terms would want to think, give it away. Why would I give it away? It's being stolen from me anyway. right? So we have to always frame when we throw out a line like that, and yet still, a gift only lives when you give it away, which is a way of saying, when we share freely of our gifts, of our bounty with each other, we gain and they gain and everybody gains. And that's been from the beginning. I, I invoked Lewis Hyde's, that line from Lewis Hyde's book, uh, early in, 19, in, in 2007 when I first started doing these lessons. That was why I said I'm going to give it all away. It was Lewis Hyde. But it was also Nat. It was all, and, and that's why I'm going to do a series of lessons for my, on behalf of my teacher and on behalf of what he taught me about how the blues world can be. Now, does this mean that if somebody says blues is black music, we have to bridle and go, wait a minute? No, I think actually it's fine to say, well, I mean, of course it is. And once it's, how could it not be? <laughs> how could it, how could blues not be black music? Uh, um, but if you're saying that, to create a hierarchy of virtue in which somebody like me is less invested in it, has less right to play it, I don't agree that with that. Partly, again, because the person that taught me, the African-American player who taught me, said, steal from everybody, always acknowledge where you got what. And again, this is in Mr. Satan's Apprentice, so this is not all new. Always acknowledge where you got what. Who did you, who'd you get that from? Did you come up with something original on your own? I thought about that when I, when, I, uh, when I did my solo album, and I felt for the first time with songs like Sunshine of Your Love and Crossroads Blues, where I was mixing Clapton and Robert Johnson and Cream, and then doing my own thing. And I was a one-man band, but I wasn't Mr. Satan's harmonica player anymore. I was doing my own thing. It's very important we find our own thing. So that's why I'm going to come to you with these lessons. So what I want to do is I want to play you a little bit as a sort of prelude, a recording that I made on the street of Nat doing Big Walter Horton's Easy. And I'm going to then upload the entire track. But this was a track, I got it on a boombox on the street, and I listened to it again and again and again. And I got so much out of it. Matching my sound, so I copied Nat. I'm not gonna, I, I will never try to pretend that my, that my sound does not owe hugely to Nats. It owes to Jason Ritchie, it owes to Paul Butterfield, it owes a little bit to Sonny Terry, a lot to James Cotton, to Sugar Blue, who first did the high note thing that blew me away because Nat pointed me at Sugar Blue and said, you need that because I heard you play in the high notes, right? What's a good teacher? Somebody who sees, who hears potential in you and who says, you need this. Now, I can't be quite that teacher for you. Wish I could, but I can't. And if you send me emails and say, listen to me play, imagine if you had an, your, my email's out there. So how many of you can I listen to? But, but I'm really happy anyway at the people who are out there, at you, I'm pointing at you, you're one of the people out there right now, right now, that you're taking something that I'm putting out there and you're doing your thing with it. And you know what gives me real pleasure? And what I talk about in, the, in my book, the fact that if we think the conversation about the blues is just a conversation between black Americans and white Americans, we are so old fashioned. We are missing so much. We are so out of touch with how the blues is actually working in the world. Nothing makes me happier than when I go online, as I did, um, I, as I've been doing recently, and I see somebody who's not American. Somebody who might be Korean. There's a Korean woman, uh, which I'll, who I'll be talking about. I'll be sharing some of this stuff. Who who plays one of her gui, guayagem, I think it's called. I, if you're from Korea, you're laughing at me. A guayagem. And she does all this old, like, Elmore James. Da -da 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 da 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 Except it has this weird, for us, for our Western ears, tonality. I love that. You're taking the blues. How could it not be black music? It's an Elmore James tune. How could it not be? And yet you're saying, I can do my own thing with it. 
I'm invested in it. I'm expressing myself through it. To me, that is the genius of this music. Now, I have my own theories about why it is that the blues is sort of contaminates everything in a wonderful way. It, it, it's moved around the world. Everybody seems to feel that they have a, a place in the music. I think that's fantastic. I think it has to do, actually, with the Senegalese element within the blues. If we think about the blues as just black music or African-American music, no, let's think about Senegal specifically. It's on trade routes. So here's an interesting thing that, I, that fascinates me. The, the sort of um, melismatic element of the blues, the whoa, the whoa, I missed one of those notes in there, but that thing, that thing that we do when we take the harp, so that comes from Senegal by way of the Arab, Senegal is a very Muslim country, and there are Arab traders, there's an Arab element, North African element that came down on the trade routes into Senegal. That's the call to prayer. It's the Muslim call to prayer. I, can, I'm not, I, I, I can't do the call to prayer. What I'm telling you is, Gerhard Kubik wrote a book called Africa and the Blues. The, what feels like the most bluesy, Mississippi-ish kind of thing is actually an Arab element within African culture, right? Senegalese culture has the ability to take whatever's out there, put it into the stew, and make it its thing. And I think blues has the ability to. It, and I think that's the genius of the blues, but it's also a reason why you can't contain it. It's out now. The blues is cats out of the bag. It's no longer just black music. It is black music. Interestingly enough, one of the key elements of the blues is this idea of two elements in tension. One of the key things about the blues is the fact, remember hearing uh, little Char uh, uh, Rick Estrin, baby, I hate to see you go, but I love to watch you walk away. I hate to see you go, but when you walk away, I'm looking at, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at what's leaving me. And it's a perfect encapsulation in its own sort of lighthearted way. So is I'm laughing just to keep from crying. You, you, don't, you don't know my mind. I'm laughing, laughing just to keep from crying. It's a much deeper, more serious element that resonates with Paul Lawrence Dunbar's uh, uh, poem. We wear the mask that grins and lies. Um, why should we let white folks out there know how we feel inside, basically, is what the poem says. So, you get into the blues, you get into black history. It's impossible, you should be impossible not to. But don't for a moment think that the blues is not also, because it's, it's always this and this. It's also about brotherhood. Um, and it's about, it's about my teacher, Nat Riddles, and what he passed along to me. So, I'm going to play... I'm going to play a track, a bit of a track called um, Easy, Nat Riddle's version of Easy. Is, that is Nat Reynolds, um, and that's, I'm going to upload that entire track, uh, something I record on the street. It's amazing. It's amazing. And to hear him to sort of stand there. Now, let me point something else out. Um, you want to do the racial sort on blues, contemporary blues? Nat's a black guy. The guitar player, Charlie Hilbert. His man became my guitar player at one point. White guy from Staten Island. New York blues, baby. The blues world, and they were brothers in terms of working the street, 
and Nat was in charge and Charlie was behind him supporting him the whole way beloved community beloved community blues is black music blues is black and white music blues is what Nat would say he did his thing called El Cafe Street he would say blues is American music it's the best we got welcome everybody he was, was always welcome welcome he set the table I love, I'm going to talk more about this, but what I love, first of all, that big clattery 1 4 draw. I got to come, I got to come back and do another lesson, right? God. And the combination of that big sound with a slow groove. You know what? That's not what he's doing. So I'm going to come back with a series of 10 lessons, the lessons of Nat Riddles. And we're going to do this. We're going to do this for Nat. We're going to do this for the principle of kind of ecumenical harmonica stealing, the sort of stealing of licks from wherever we hear something nice. We're going to acknowledge where we got what. So these are not key lessons, but then they're not numbered lessons, but these are actually Nat's key lessons. We're going to try to welcome people to the party. We're going to try to welcome people in. Okay? And we're going to try to draw a few fewer lines. Understanding that brotherhood is real. Some of us have lived it. And those of us who've lived it need to testify. Okay? I'll be back with you soon. Bye-bye.